Hey guys, uh, here with another devlog for episode two of the Dream of Shadowlands. Um, so I've been working on some more rooms for the second level of the game. So let me just show you what I've been doing. So um, if you guys recall, we've been leaving off with this sort of forked path to kind of um, clear this part of the level. So uh, I already showed you guys the first two paths that I had done. So I finished up the third one and this will finish up the whole section of this level. Um, so when you take this path, it leads you right into this room. Um, there will probably be like monsters or something in here. It's, you know, one of those emptier kind of rooms that doesn't have much going on. So it'll either kind of just be a transition or it'll have something for you to poke at, basically. <laughs> then that leads you down into this other forked sort of path. Um, so this kind of ties in with the um, puzzle object of episode two with the cards that you can decipher codes with. So uh, the sign in this room um, when it's decoded, it says mercy. So if you go this way, this is the safer way to go. This way is the more dangerous way to go. So if you go the quote unquote intended way, um, the better way to go, it leads you down into this room, which I'll probably just put one monster in. Um, not much to say about this one because this path is pretty uh, empty in comparison to the other one. Um, then when you go through here, it leads you down into this room. Again, maybe just one monster in here. Uh, not sure, 100%. Um, maybe some item pickups, we'll have to see. And then when you go through this loop here, it leads you into this tiny room that will have the last metal ball in it. Um, and basically it is the point that the two paths kind of converge back into each other. So on this side is where you came from the safe way, this side is where you will come from the dangerous way, and you can go back through either way. So going back to here, if you go this way, um, then it will lead into this room. And there's a bunch of spikes in here that will hurt you if you touch them. Uh, besides that, I wanna put enough, as many monsters in here as I can without making it impossible to clear. Um, just because I kind of want it to be like, oh, this is this way is the really difficult way to go if you don't decipher it properly, or if you just don't really pay attention to the puzzles and you just kind of guess, then like this can be like a repercussion for just guessing blindly. Um, so I kind of also wanted to make it like, oh, all the, uh, sort of scenery around it is just kind of like laughing at you so I just drew a bunch of faces that are just laughing and I want to make a different kind of track to overlay whatever music I end up playing in this section to make it sound a little bit more like uh, imposing and demonic uh, so when you get through here um, leads you into this part this section of this uh, path is a little bit more forgiving it's mostly this first room kind of as shock value to be like, oh, this way is dangerous. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, but I want it to be that this path closes off once you go through it uh, until you get the metal ball, then it unlocks again. So then that way it's like, oh, you can't just go in and then change your mind, nope your way out of there. No, you gotta, you made your bed, now you have to lie in it if you go this way. So then you go back through here. Again, as many monsters as I can put in here. Um, without making it impossible is what I plan to do. Um, and then again, leads you into this room and you can go back up through this way if you so choose. Um, so then when you have the last metal ball, uh, you have all of them in here. Again, the key will be in here. It'll kind of unlock when all the balls are in there and then you will have the next key to proceed through whichever gate you choose next in the main sort of lobby of the temple. Um, so again, like these pieces here will be a ladder that materializes like on one of these sides. I haven't decided uh, exactly where it'll be, um, but it'll be, uh, it'll materialize and like lead up all the way into the top level again. So this is kind of a collection of sprites that I drew for 
getting you back to the top where Rena trips and falls from. Uh, so this will be a room that has three walls on like these sides. <laughs> um, and it'll lead you back up and down. So then that way you can go back through um, because this will actually be the way to the end of the uh, level. Um, so then when you have the last key after clearing all the different sections that are blocked by gates, you'll be able to go back down here. It'll lead you back to the big gate that I drew that's next to that pile of bricks and that corpse. So anyway, when you get through this room, you can go on this side. Um, these are separate sprites, so kind of don't pay them any mind. Wherever Where this crease is here is where this room, basically, the wall ends. So when you get through there, there will just be a plain room with just a bunch of brick walls uh, on the sides. Then um, there will be this sort of plank of wood that you can interact with and bring it over to the room where Rena tripped and sort of bridge the gap between the two uh, broken floors. And then so that'll be the way that it connects basically where you tripped and fell from all the way back to where the lobby is. So then that way you can kind of bridge the gap both figuratively and literally between where you were locked out of going back and now you can continue. So anyway, that wraps up a whole quarter of the entire second episode, basically. This was um, about 30 rooms, I believe, when all was said and done uh, over the past few videos, just between all the sprites that I did and did not have to draw. Um, it'll total to 30 rooms. I'm going to be doing another 30 for each quarter of the temple. So the four gates in the lobby will each have 30 rooms behind them. And so that way we will have an even bigger level than the first episode was because it was, I believe, it was somewhere just above 90 rooms. So when everything is done with the second episode, I'm planning to have like 130, 135 rooms with it. Um, so it should be a pretty good size, hopefully. <laughs> um, so with this update that I'm still planning to episode one with optimization and combat balancing, I've been kind of thinking about what else I can add, basically because this update is going to take a while. Uh, I'm still waiting on hearing back from the programmer I've been talking with, and that's the main sort of thing determining how long this update is going to take to roll out. So I've been kind of thinking about, well, if I have to spend more time kind of just sitting on my hands, what can I do to make the whole game better? And one of the things that I heard from a good amount of reviews on Steam was that people wanted to hear more hints, kind of have more um, things pointing them in the right direction if they get lost. And this, I think, will be a lot more important, especially as the levels get less linear. Because episode one, I tried to make pretty linear in terms of where you are where you have to go, whereas you could backtrack to find secrets, and that's mostly it. So since a lot of people were saying that they wanted more hints with the first episode, I really figured I needed to step up my game with hints in the second episode. <laughs> because this one is a lot more, you can choose where you want to go and it's not as linear. So in figuring out what I can do about that, I decided to go with, approach, with an approach that's similar to what they do in Phoenix Wright, where you go back to the law offices and you can talk to your assistant and ask them what should we do now, things like that. So I decided I was going to implement a feature where you can do that with Jill. So with the pause menu, I have a tab for the diary above the settings. And um, I kind of was wanting to get rid of that tab for a while in terms of like where it's placed because when you click on the other key item, the cipher wheel, when you click on it in the item tray, that's what opens that page of the menu. And I wanted to do something similar where if you click on the sprite of the diary in the item tray, that that should be where the diary is actually opened from instead of having it in the separate uh, drop down menu. So now in the drop down menu, I have been working on making um, 
a section where you can talk to Jill and ask him questions like, what should we do now? And depending on what point in the level you're in, he'll give you a different answer. Naturally, because this is going to have a lot more lines, uh, these dialogues won't be voice acted, but that'll give me a lot of time to actually make the dialogue itself as like in depth as I can without having to worry about the time it'll take for me and Santino to record more lines and me having to edit them and mix them and everything and then add them all into the game, which takes a really long amount of time um, because the dialogue is just so heavy and there's so much uh, audio editing and filters and stuff like that involved in basically every sort of audio that I add to the game because I like to add filters. <laughs> I'm hoping that just having these be uh, voice acted with the Vox, which is the kind of beeping sounds, should help. Anyway, on to my point. <laughs> so I wanted to use this as an opportunity to kind of demonstrate how I do the art in the game. This is the sprite that I drew for when you are talking to Jill, and basically I want to use this as his um, body sprite, but his expression will change. So that's why he does not have any eyes, eyebrows, or mouth in this picture. Those are all on this side. So it'll have him blinking, it'll have him opening and closing his mouth. I kind of wanted to make it more like visual novel, dating simmy type of like attention to detail with the um, sprite portrait and different expressions and all like the different ways that you can bring a character to life in those kind of games. Uh, I just kind of wanted to walk you guys through how I take what I draw on paper and I turn that into a sprite. Um, usually as you can see with the rooms that I've done, I usually scan them on a traditional scanner. <laughs> With these, uh, when it's just a single page uh, character art, I usually have a little bit of leeway with that. I can usually get away with just taking a picture on my phone. And as long as the lighting isn't too bad and the angle isn't too bad, then it's okay. Like as you can see, it's taken as a photo. There's not super perfect quality to it. But because the sprite is going to be on the smaller side because it's just a character and not like a whole room, uh, you can get away with a bit. So the first thing I do when I have a photo all kind of cropped and ready is you go into contrast and bump that up as far as you can and I also lower the depth because photos tend to have a sort of yellowy tone to them because of the lighting. Um, then you just kind of double check make sure that everything looks good and I can work with that. Okay so then you take your magic wand selection tool thing. Uh, you do all similar colored pixels and I do it pretty low, like depending on how big the picture is. If it's on the smaller side, you want to have it like maybe one or two. But if it's a bigger one like this, anything like below 10 is usually good. So you select the white and delete, deselect, and you double check your line work and I think it all looks good. There we go. Okay, so usually that leaves a few white pixels um, as a bit of an outline around everything. So I take the brightness, bring it all the way down so that now we have perfectly clean line art for making a sprite. At this point, I usually go over the proportions with the transform tool, kind of make sure I like everything. Um, I pretty much like this. It's just that I think that um, I want the proportions on the bottom to be a little bit bigger. I think I made the top uh, a little bit too top heavy. There we go. I think that is better. Yep. Okay. So this is the line art I'm going to be working with now. So now all you have to do is make a separate layer for coloring and I'm going to go ahead and color this now. now that I have this all colored, I basically go through this whole thing and I add the shading. So as you could probably tell from the other character sprites that I've done, uh, I don't 
actually shade with color, I shade with lines. So how I did that is I made my own custom screen tone. So let's go with this one. I think this one will be okay because it kind of depends on um, what size sprite I'm using. Um, but if it doesn't work right off the bat, I usually just resize it. Yeah, so that's one. This one was a lot smaller. Let's go ahead and size it up. And it's pretty loose how I kind of go with the sizing on this. Um, it's very much like arbitrary. I don't have like an official sizing that I go with for the line thickness or the spacing or anything. Uh, I just basically go with what feels right. And this right here feels right to me, so there we go. So now that I have my screen tone in, I basically go through and I select everything take the selection eraser and then you will basically just remove every section that you want the shading to be in so i'm going to go ahead and do that now So then when you're all happy with how the shading looks, I go ahead and delete all of the selected parts of it. And then you are left with the shading that you like. So this is the finished sprite for Jill's body when you talk to him in the pause menu. So since he's still lacking a face, let's do something about that. So I am just going to crop the photo so that it only has the important parts. There we go. And then it is just the same process as what I went through with the last picture, so I'm just gonna go ahead and speed this up. Okay, so now Jill has his expression, so he looks a lot more normal now. Uh, and as you can see, I kind of just compare him to what I just use as the sort of model sheet, which is the character portraits. So now that I'm happy with how he looks, I'm just going to go ahead and color all of these parts of his expression. there we have it there is the basic sort of sprite i have for this new feature of the game so this is only the base neutral expression this doesn't include all the different uh emotions and the talking and blinking or anything but basically i just wanted to get it to this point to show you guys kind of my process so i hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'm going to keep working on this sprite and hopefully have something cool to show you next time. Alright, see you guys later.